In the beginning, man discovered fire and invented the wheel. Several thousand years later came the railway. From that point on, the world entered a new age. The story of locomotion is the story of change. Man created the railway and then found he had to come to terms with it. The combination of steam and iron was a magic formula that would mobilize the present and transform the future. After the railway was built and the first train arrived, the people all looked at it with fear and admiration. They saw this machine with dozens of carriages and they said, how powerful these infidels, these foreigners are. It pulls a hundred coaches and it neither eats nor drinks. interesting things in all of railway literature is to watch everybody comment on the notion of speed. Speed before railroads was measured in terms of how fast a canal boat went, how fast a horse went, but suddenly railroads went eight miles an hour, twice as fast as anybody had ever been. And when you got a railroad that went 15 or 20 miles an hour, people were scared to death. The countryside passed in a blur. They couldn't understand that a human being could go this fast on earth and not lose parts of himself in the, in the process of the journey. And there were some funny things off speed. Stick your head out the window and spit into the wind. And it would come back and hit you before you could move your head, which is an indication of going just about as fast as man was built to go. The first travelers of the railway age were setting out on a journey through time and space into a world they themselves were creating. The railways invented the modern world before men for transport had depended on nature. They depended on the sea, they depended on the winds, the tides, they depended on animals. And now all of a sudden, 
Here was a marvellous weapon they could use in their eternal struggle against nature. And they could use it to go as far as they wanted in the most inhospitable circumstances. People found it could do almost anything. And the longer they went, the more miracles they could achieve with it. I think the biggest single miracle of the railways was how soon they triumphed over the most extraordinary obstacles that within 10, 20, 30 years they conquered the Alleghenies, which were supposed to be impossible, they conquered the Alps within 30, 40 years, they conquered the Rockies, they conquered even the Andes. They got 15,000 feet up, 5,000 meters up in the Andes within 30, 40 years. Man dominated nature in a way that nobody had ever dreamt was possible. Science challenged nature, and men used technology to compete with God. The man-made glory of the railway age broke down the natural order that until then had governed people's lives. It changed man's relationship with nature. He could suddenly move through nature very, very quickly rather than wandering through it slowly. He could bypass nature. It was a sensation that they had never felt before. And it was something to tell their children and grandchildren for generations about what it felt like all at one time. It's amazing how quickly time passes. At the turn of the century, the railway seemed the wonder of the age, a miracle of technology, at least here in Russia, Siberia. It was a breakthrough into a new century, a new civilization. I remember when the railway appeared in this area and the trains were leaving. I really had this feeling of wanting to go with them as if they were the call of an unknown far away. You really felt you wanted to get on the train. It seemed that somehow, somewhere, there were these interesting places it could take you to. Some stations were well known. Travellers, whenever they arrived at a particular place, would say, right, this is the place for terrific cucumbers. You really have to try them. At another station, they would say, now this is where to get boiled potatoes. At every station, people came to the train and sold things. People enjoyed themselves however they could. They got to know each other. They played cards. The children were reading. Well, as far as kids go, they're the same everywhere. The children played. They got to know each other straight away. People began to tell each other everything about themselves. Ever since George Stevenson's rocket, wherever railways went, they inspired wonder and fear. The train was called the Devil's Carriage, the magic machine. It carried kings and commoners, soldiers and convicts. It brought people, towns and countries together. Along the way, the train left its mark on the world itself and on how people saw their world. One of the railway's most extraordinary impacts, and one that is very difficult to define, was, in a sense, the dehumanizing of travel, your alienation from the landscape. We're used to it. Because we've gone one stage further by traveling in giant jet-propelled tubes above the clouds, we don't think about it because we're so used to anonymous forms of travel. But for people who'd never known that sort of lack of contact, it was deeply disturbing. 
the railway was the first step in making travel less gritty, less earthbound, less in touch with the soil. I mean, it was a not a natural form of progress. Safely insulated from the elements, the Glacier Express in Switzerland ambles through the landscape. Cocooned in comfort, its passengers create their own inner world, where nature is merely decoration. In the new interior world of the train, the landscape was reduced to an accessory, there if wanted, but easily ignored. Inside the machine, new codes and customs evolved. Reading became a natural part of the process of moving from place to place when people lost interest in seeing where they were. Eating added to the sense of the train being a separate community, advancing through space in its own time. Train travel gave social contact as compensation for the detachment from nature. Life persevered inside the machine. In the world the railways were making, movement was en masse. Passengers left and arrived together. The new freedom to move was tempered by the order the railways demanded. Our clocks are all radio controlled. That means on each station you have exactly the same time. Time to Swiss railways is the most important thing you can imagine because if you have no clocks on the right time for railways, then uh, you will miss the, the timetable. Before the Industrial Revolution, before the railways, people went by the time in their vicinity, in their local town, in their local city. But the railways needed a standard time, which amounted to a sort of industrial discipline they had to impose in order to run railways, in order to run their trains regularly, so that they were providing a service which people would want and so on. So what they did was effectively impose their own grid, impose their own standards, impose their own discipline. So that by 1850 in England and 1880 in the States, you had a standard railway time. Railroads, because they had to operate to the minute uh, to prevent wrecks, uh, to, to make connections between railroads, had to redefine time. And they did it initially by taking time and putting it up on the depot. And that became railroad time. The depot became the center, the center of towns and villages. It's the place where things happened. It's where news came in, where the telegraph was situated, where merchandise for the stores arrived, where newspapers came in, where virtually everything happened, where people left. You went to meet friends and greet friends, say goodbye to your lover, whatever else happened. You did it at the depot, and, and you had to do it at the time the train arrived or departed. And therefore, the depot clock became the central timepiece in every village and hamlet in the country. Before the advent of railways, we used to have only four timings, morning, noon time, evening time, and night time. So if I say that, look here, I am coming to your house tomorrow morning, it could be anything from 8 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock in the morning. Or if I say tomorrow evening, I will have an appointment with you, it could be from 4 o'clock in the evening right up to 8 o'clock in the evening. But after the advent of the railways, this notion changed. Now if I say I'm reaching your house in the evening, well, it will be precisely 6 o'clock or 6.30 or something like that. The railways reorganized time to suit their own ends, and passengers learned to accept the new rhythms of railway life. In Russia, the railway crossed seven time zones and imposed one time throughout. Wherever you were in the Russian Empire,
Whatever you were doing there, inside a station or on a train, it was always Moscow time. Railways forced not only standardization, but also cutting time down into ever smaller segments. And we rushed to meet those segments and make them important. Suddenly watches were worn by people because they had to know what time it was. To do all sorts of things, get their teeth fixed, uh, anything, eat, it made no difference. And it came off the depot clock. You know, the people is living through time, especially in Switzerland. And uh, the Swiss people is working for time working after time, working by time, uh, and so on, and has no, nearly no time to sleep because of the time, you know? In America, as the demand for living space grew, settlers headed west to grab land for themselves. In the land runs of the late 1800s, he who went fastest and furthest stood to gain the best land. The railway was a new weapon to speed up the conquest. We were a nation only 40 years old when the first railway trains began running. Therefore, railroads came as a godsend because what they did was two things. They allowed us to expand at an even faster rate. But at the same time, ironically, they also brought us together because they made it very easy to go from one section, one state, one territory to another, uh, all over the con eastern part of the continent. Therefore, we had, a, we had a feeling of political cohesion at the same time that we had this dispersion of population that would enable us to take advantage of the natural resources out to our west. At the time, I'd like to just introduce myself to you. My name is Gary Holtzoy. I am a member of the Navajo Nation. My Navajo name means a warrior of the metal people. This is how you say my name in Navajo. Travel itself was being redefined. As the new technology swept America, so the vast territory yielded to the demands of the immigrants. The train was creating new destinations for its passengers, as towns sprang up where the railway chose to go. This area of New Mexico and Arizona is still referred to as the Wild West an area occupied by Pueblo Indians who culture and history go back thousands of years, by the Navajos and the Apaches who came here just shortly before the Spaniards in the 1500s. The Santa Fe Trail followed an old Indian trail on which a number of Pueblos had established themselves. So this represented a large amount of land being taken away from Indian use and occupation. picked up on the fact that their railway went through Indian country. And they made a concerted sales pitch nationally, selling Indian country. They renamed their trains, the Super Chief, the Chief, the Navajo. They developed a, a calendars and posters and publicity in national magazines, all relating to the fact that come out to the West, see Indians see sand painters, see rug weavers, but take the train. The Santa Fe Railway organized what it called detours to give the ever more urbanized Americans a glimpse of their hour. Native Americans were recruited as players in the spectacle, as the detourists took trains, not just for travel, but for a sense of adventure. This was an ongoing national publicity, promoting a, an image of the Indian that, yes, was romanticized and, and looking at it as the, the last of the, the noble red men. Here is an opportunity to come and see them. And doing away with the fear of the West, it's not an unknown. It's a beautiful area. Come and see it. Come and visit. <laughs> 
suddenly the people on the move weren't frontiersmen or, or rough and ready folk with their family who were willing to go out and brave the dangers. You could get, now get on a railroad coach, ride for 24 hours, find yourself on the edge of civilization somewhere, and you're just as mobile as Daniel Boone had been. To publicize their new domain, the Santa Fe commissioned famous artists of the day to come to the Southwest and paint the original inhabitants and the landscape. The Southwest and its people were being recreated in the railway's chosen image. Having made the West accessible, the Santa Fe then began to make it hospitable. In 1878, they hired an Englishman, Fred Harvey, to feed their passengers, stylishly and quickly. The railway wanted to go first class. The Harvey houses, the restaurants, the motels or the hotels that were established along the route produced some of the best meals, best lodging that you could find anywhere in the country. Trains would stop at these Harvey houses. You'd have several hundred people getting off the train, all fed, taken care of, and back on the train in less than an hour. Make room for the next train coming along uh, two hours later and doing the same thing all over again. He wanted his girls to look like nuns or like nurses. The training was strict, very strict. And Miss Jenny was head waitress in the dining room, and she had been with Fred Harvey 44 years then. And uh, Miss Jenny preferred that I didn't serve in the dining room too often because I was not graceful enough to suit her. They kept us so busy. Any time that you weren't serving people, you were busy folding napkins and being sure that everything was in perfect order. And even to this day, when I go somewhere and it isn't uh, well served, it bothers me because our training was so intense in that field. The silver was polished perfectly. The napkins were folded in a certain way. Everything was placed at, at the table settings just right. And it better be right. The linens came from Ireland. and and. They had beautiful banquets. It was really called the cultural center of, the, of each little town this along the way. This is fine, thank you. Everything's all right? Thank Everything's you. Everything's fine, thank you. Are you finished with your pipe? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Take this away for you. You ladies? So that was, that was the, the, the touch of refinement he brought. Uh, if people have good food and clean places to stay, they become more civilized than if they're just out in the wilderness. So that's what we mean when we say he civilized the West. The train brought adventure for some and leisure for others. For the European rich with money to spend and time to enjoy it, travel became a new fashion. The blue train from Paris to the coast was all first class. The French Riviera, opened up by rail, was swamped by an excess of style. Pampered passengers had little to worry about. All they had to do was display themselves in the bright Mediterranean sun, now so easily available through the magic of the train. <laughs> 
Nice was invaded by the English and the Russians, along with their royalty. What had been a run-down fishing port in the mid-19th century was transformed into an international pleasure zone. The borders between countries were made invisible, as those who could afford to cheat the seasons carried their social rituals south to the sun. Geography was being redrawn by the railways, and it seemed that nothing in the reach of the train would remain the same. Railroads were sold as the wave of the future, progress, a way to achieve expansion and prosperity and all the other good things that life promised. They were also sold as an invention of the gods, put in the hands of man. There's a, there's a, there's a spiritual aspect to them, uh, to steam locomotives. They took on a life of their own. They're, they're almost they're most divine, right? And the interesting thing about that is it made the people who ruled the railroads, the people who ran the railroads, it also put them on a level of the deities as well because it gave them control over nature, as God has control over nature. It gave them control over distance. It gave them control over mobility. It gave them control over prosperity. And it's the same kind of control that God has. And so the railroads very quickly were seen by the public as a divine scientific intervention in the unalterable march to progress. Before the railway came here, uh, Miami had a handful of people. As late as 1895, there were maybe a dozen people living along the Miami River, uh, and that was essentially it. Uh, the railway came in in April of 96, and it magically transformed this place. And this was a, the, an isolated area dominated by the Everglades with a handful of people living along a couple of the waterways. There was actually nothing here until the end of the 19th century. Railways brought prosperity to remote corners and extreme wealth to those who made them. In the 1890s, Henry Flagler, an oil billionaire, set out to create modern Florida, and he built it with railways. Flagler's importance to Florida, uh, it's not a case of saying it can't be overestimated. It's a case of saying that without Flagler, there would be no Florida. At least, there wouldn't be a Florida that we know today. Flagler had dreamed up his version of paradise, and he had the money to make it real. He created a railroad going from Jacksonville all the way down to the end of Florida on Key West over the islands and the ocean. Eventually, boats that took people to Havana, to uh, Cuba, to uh, the Bahamas. And I thought eventually that his setup of the railroad coming down would lead to a transportation link with the then building Panama Canal. It would be one of the greatest links uh, of advantage, you know, in, in the entire country. Here's what a journalist of the Times had to say. It is to be doubted whether mere figures can give an adequate idea of the magnitude of Flagler's work. He has spent $41 million in Florida, $18 million on the railroad, $10 million in the Key West Extension, and $12 million in hotels. What it comes down to is that Flagler has made the east coast of Florida. The island of Palm Beach was no more than a coconut grove until Flagler came along. He created the most exclusive resort in America and built the Breakers Hotel as a haven for his millionaire friend. You can make an analogy, really, with Disney, taking an empty uh, section of Florida in the middle of the state and building his whole, what's now known as Disney World. Flagler here found something that was absolutely untouched, except for a few houses, and then could create totally what he wanted. Of course, Mr. Flagler was involved with what was then the 400 of New York. They'd already followed down and used his magnificent hotels in St. Augustine, and he thought they would come here, and he, of course, he was right. People began to arrive in droves. 
The hotels were immediately popular. He would bring the Hungarian string orchestra. He even brought people such as Emma Ames, who was a famous opera star, Nellie Melba. It's even said Caruso came and sang, but I haven't been able to track that one down to more than legend. Flagler's scheme struck gold as his railways unleashed tourism on Florida. However, he did not live to see his playground for the rich open to everybody. Remember that people in those days went resorting, and they would come down, they had so much money, that they would come down and they would spend the entire season. And yes, initially, that was the concept, we'll bring down all of our rich friends. But they realized very quickly that in order to make all of these hotels go, that you had to bring down everybody. They added coaches to the formerly all Pullman trains, so that indeed those that couldn't afford the Pullman fares could still come down on the coaches. And then they had your home seekers fares and your excursionist fares, and the idea was bring them all down. Get them all down, get them to spend their money, but by God, let's get them here. pilgrimage had been man's first incentive to leave home. In France, religion and science were reunited when a young peasant girl, Bernadette Sobirou, had a vision. The new railway being built from Bayonne to Toulouse was diverted to the Holy Shrine and opened simultaneously with a grotto in 1866. Lourdes never looked back. The train gave mobility to the infirm, and thousands flocked to Lourdes in search of a cure. Special white ambulance trains were laid on to meet the demand, and priests held mobile services en route. Religion and the railway served each other faithfully as what would have been a local ritual became an international pilgrimage by rail. The steam locomotive and the cutting edge of progress and the promise of the future was equated in many people's minds with the spiritual aspect of, of the deity of God, that there was a sort of godly design in the locomotive itself. And it shows up in, in the literature that uh, the locomotive was a special province sent by God to uh, lead people to the promised land. The promised land may be west, it may be out in the prairie somewhere, it may be just over the mountains, but it's promised with a capital P. In the great cities, vast monuments appeared to the prosperity and grandeur of the railways. Stations were the cathedrals of the age. Cities vied with each other to create these altars to achievement and aspiration. For the new Grand Central Terminal in New York, money was no object, since by now, railways were ways of making money. There was a terminal built here in 1871. This is not the first one on the site. We had an open rail yard back that way, which is up Park Avenue right now. And between Madison Avenue on this side and Lexington Avenue over on this side, and from 42nd Street all the way to 59th Street, in the middle of this island, was an open rail yard. By 1902, there was a major explosion on a train right up there on Park Avenue where 15 people were killed because of all of the fumes, the steam, and the smoke. It was decided then that they needed to electrify these trains so they could bring them easily into the city. The engineers constructed a giant 43-acre roof over the entire complex. They dug 48 feet down into Manhattan Island to create three separate levels for the trains. Underground were 83 tracks 
to carry 700 trains a day. Above ground was a new New York. All of the air above this open rail yard was sold to all of the buildings that now line Park Avenue. They're actually built on top of what, what you could think of as a bridge. And the, the $180 million that this building cost at the day, which was too grand for any, any building project up to that point, was only affordable because they were able to sell all of the air above their tracks. And this was a new real estate concept. In fact, in the years between 1904 and 1926, the city of New York had its real estate prices go up by 26%. In this immediate vicinity, the prices went up by 244%. This was a boondoggle. It was an amazing way of making money out of thin air and an open rail yard. In Bombay, the British built a monument to the stability of imperial power. But what they left behind was a temple to the mobility of the railway age. Each train carries nine cars, and each train is supposed to carry 1,750 people, about 850 persons sitting and 850 persons standing. But now uh, you can see that each train is carrying uh, more than 3,000 uh, passengers. Uh, we are dealing with 2.7 million commuters here in Bombay per day. From the very beginning, while the railways were being built, they were thought of in military terms. Marx called them the light cavalry of capitalism. And Eric Hobsbawm, the historian, called them the shock troops of industrialization. So people thought in these military terms because they brought with them what you might call a natural good order and military discipline. So you had this emphasis on discipline, on uniforms, throughout railway companies throughout the world, because, after all, armies were the only organizations spread over any area that required the sort of organization that a major railway company did. Mobile people posed a new administrative problem, and the burgeoning bureaucracies came up with a variety of solutions. In the same year, 1837, the postage stamp and the railway ticket were introduced. One posted mail, the other posted passengers. People felt that they were packages or parcels. They weren't human beings going from one place to another. It wasn't of their own volition. They were simply packages or bits of freight being sent by some anonymous force outside themselves to their destination. There are rules in the commercial manual uh, regarding the conveyance of snakes by rail uh, and the action necessary when these are detected uh, being carried in the compartments. Snakes can be carried uh, in the brake van, uh, should be packed in the boxes or uh, wooden baskets uh, with securely fastened, uh, closely fitting lids. And snakes are not permitted uh, to be carried with owners 
in the passenger compartment. Similarly, live tortoises should be packed in bamboo or hamper stick baskets. The basket should be of uh, such type that tortoises may not be able to protrude their neck out of the container. Calves under 0.76 meter uh, in the height. Pigs, sheep and goats. For man and beast, the railways set the terms of travel. Wherever they went and however far, railways, because they telescoped distance, made intermediary little communities less important. They had a terrific centrifugal effect, sucking the life out of smaller communities into bigger communities. And this applied in the countryside, in urban areas, and it applied also nationally, so that big towns, big cities, and above all, capital cities, could accumulate more direct power to themselves because the distance no longer mattered. There was no longer any distance between a king and his subject. A newspaper editor asserted that the locomotive engine has in 20 years become the great agent of civilization and progress, the most powerful instrument for good the world has yet reached, and become the most effective messenger for proclaiming peace on earth and goodwill to men. The age of locomotion is the era of progress. Wherever the railway extends, knowledge and civilization advance in geometrical ratio. Great quote. In Central Asia, the railway arrived with the Russian conquerors at the end of the 19th century. This was the old Silk Route, but times and trade had moved on, and the towns along the way were left in isolation. Russian imperialism was confronting Islam. Muslims dominated the Silk Route, then and now. Ancient cities like Samarkand and its neighbor, Bukhara, were even more devout than Mecca and Medina. The religion of Islam was dedicated to the traditions of feudal society. It was against innovation, especially the introduction of railways. The Muslims associated them with the Russian infidels and tried by every means possible to prevent them building railways here in Central Asia. There were all sorts of speeches against them. And then in 1916, they started to destroy railway construction work, both in Gizark and we had it here in Krasnovodsk and in a series of other regions. When Russia began its policy of conquest in Asia, naturally the military were followed by merchants and bankers and this was true of Bukhara. They started to set up all kinds of joint stock companies. A railway was built across all of the Emirate, and in 1888, when it was finished, Russian money started to flood into this area. Whenever the train arrived, it delivered the baggage of westernization. But not all regional rulers felt threatened. The Emir himself was well disposed to the railway. He already had connections with Russia and Europe through trade. He had caravans going to Russia, so he was very interested in the railway to help his business, to improve transport communications. Some of the biggest merchants in Russia wanted him to allow the railway to go through Bukhara. However, the Islamic leaders insisted that the line should not cross the town itself, but go around it. So the station was built 12 miles outside Bukhara, at Kagan. By moving the site of the station, the local Islamic leaders could alter the route of the railway, though not its impact. What Nash Pradit? Benjamin Aminov 
My great-grandfather, Benjamin Amenov, along with other Bukhara Jews, sold wines and spirits to Russian soldiers. In the late 19th century, before the railway, my ancestors had to bring distillery equipment here by camel. However, at the beginning of the 20th century, thanks to the railway, they could bring new equipment all the way from Berlin with much less expense and far fewer problems. So the construction of the railway was very important for my family. The business expanded enormously. The family became millionaires. Well known not only in Central Asia, but internationally. As the train traversed all five continents, it brought with it the sights and sounds of a wider world and overturned the world that people had known. With the building of the railway, local people came into contact with the Russians who worked on it. My grandfather met a Russian engineer called Lampen and took his teenage son to the engineer's house. When the boy saw the engineer's three daughters, he was overcome by how beautiful they were. He had always been told that such women would go to hell. But seeing these girls as beautiful as mermaids, he thought to himself, how can such gorgeous creatures end up in hell? From that point on, he could never again believe that the things told to him by his parents were true. lived before railways were made belong to another world. Your railroad starts the new era and we of a certain age belong to the new time and the old one. We who lived before railways and survive out of the ancient world are like Father Noah and his family out of the ark. The children will gather round and say to us patriarchs, tell us grandpapa about the old world and we shall mumble our old stories and we shall drop off one by one and there will be fewer of us and these very old and feeble. There will be about ten pre-railroadites left, then three, then two, then one, then none. man would soon go faster and further than the train. Science and technology were now at the controls and human destiny was out of nature's hands. No shock would ever be as great as the change the railways made. Victoria Terminal Station in Bombay is part of this world which the railways have made. It's very simple. Florida is part of the world that the railways made. Современная Бухара – это часть мира, которую создали железные дороги. Grand Central Terminal is part of that world that the railroads made. <laughs> 
greases, the oilers. Then you had drivers, then you had firemen, then you had cleaners, then you had people that cleaned out the fire dropper, then you had the fellow that kindled the engines, then you had the tuber that tubed the engines, then you had the fitters that serviced the engines. Britain was the world's first railway country. The story of its first locomotives and lines is one of heroic engineers stepping into a technological unknown. Building the railways and making them work would be a matter of painful trial and error. The speed with which they covered the country was dramatic, and it came at a price, placing new demands on the environment and on people. Great commercial and industrial struggles would be played out on Britain's railway, but they became the example for the world, and the new skills the railways generated would be a source of pride. I loved it. It was, it was every schoolboy's dream to be on the Mala, coming down at 90 to 100 miles an hour. But the thing you had to do, and this only came by experience, was to judge speed. Now, even today, at the age of 80, I could tell a motor car's speed, looking at it, almost by just having a, a glance along the road. You had to do that because if you were coming to a station and you were stopping as a driver, you were stopping two or three hundred yards before the station because there were all the people drinking coffee behind, people in sleeping cars, and you couldn't spill them out or spill the coffee. So you had to come from a high express speed of something like 80 to 90 miles an hour in about a mile and stop at the station so, as I, we used to say, on a little scotch threepenny bit at the end of the station. And you brought it in, oop, just a little doop, where the cup went, oh, that's all right, we're stopped. <laughs> The railways were not always under such precise control. From the moment the locomotive was invented, over 100 years before the great days of the steam expresses, the struggle to tame the new technology began. It all started with coal. By the 1800s, coal had replaced wood as the primary fuel. Britain was the world's main supplier, but most of the collieries of northeast England were landlocked. The lack of adequate transport between the mines and the docks on the River Tyne stood in the way of expansion. Where there were no canals, the coal was moved in horse-drawn wagons. Smooth rails and flanged wheels had been used for centuries, but the limited speed and strength of horsepower hampered growth. You had, at the beginning of the 19th century, something like 3,000 men horses and carts, carrying coal down to the States. And it would have continued, but we had a Napoleonic War, and the price of fodder went up, to such an extent that it was very expensive to have one horse, one man, and one cart. In the coal fields, the pressure was on for an alternative source of power. And just as rails were already a fixture in the mines, so the other essential ingredient for railways was already there. Steam. The earliest steam engines had been built to pump water out of the mine shaft. These engines were huge and never designed to move, but the potential power was there. In the north of England, power had been long produced from coal and they learned to apply that. Plentiful supplies of coal, plentiful supplies of iron and steel, and those were the ingredients of a locomotive. It was the adaptation of steam, this new form of motive power, self-contained, something that didn't need to have hay put into it or went sick. There was a piece of machinery there that men could, could coerce or force into working. In the winter months, it wasn't um, affected by the same problems. It could go through bad weather, it could go through good weather. The elements were there, and there were elements within the engine that, that provided this almost natural power. The steam locomotive would transform the coal fields, and the man who got the credit became the first railway hero. In fact, George Stevenson did not invent the locomotive, he did not invent the railway. In the early 1820s, there were experiments with steam-hauled wagons in mines across the country. But Stevenson's achievement 
was to take the railways beyond the coal fields. The Stockton and Darlington Railway opened in 1825 and recreated here for its centenary caused a national sensation. No one anticipated the huge public response as 500 people climbed aboard. By popular demand, Stevenson's coal line became the first public railway. It was the beginning of a whole new industry. His vision didn't just encompass the, uh, the building of locomotives, and his articles to his apprentices said they got to learn everything from building bridges to uh, learning how to scale over mountains to, uh, to, uh, to forming a thread upon a nut, uh, to building a platform. They had to do the whole concept of railway engineering. Timothy Hackworth was Stevenson's blacksmith on the Stockton and Darlington and is an unsung hero of early railway history. The first locomotives had no brakes and their boilers were prone to exploding. For Hackworth, the challenge was to turn the locomotive into a machine that actually worked. He had to work on the first four Stevenson locomotives which had come from the 4th Street Works at Newcastle. There were continual problems with them. In fact, the safety valve was held down until that time, which was quite frightening. Um, and he introduced a spring so that the steam pressure would push it up. It was a very, very inexact science. There were no lathes, really, as we know them. So wheels had to be made in sections. Every part of it must have been an absolute nightmare to build. In those early years, the success of the railway pioneers was by no means guaranteed. Progress is very, very uneven. The first four locomotives on the Stockton and Darlington Railway were not terribly efficient. Hackworth asked to have the chance to build a locomotive to prove the supremacy of steam power over horses once and for all. And the great importance with this was that at that time, the directors of the Stockton and Darlington Railway might well have gone back to using horses altogether. It illustrates this very rocky and unstable nature of development, that where a scenario works well in one place, it doesn't necessarily work well elsewhere. And they hadn't quite grasped the concept of what a locomotive could do and what it couldn't do. This was where George Stevenson's son, Robert, built the line between Stanhope and Durham and the River Tyne. The challenge was to take a line into the foothills of the Pennines. And here they learned that building a railway could be more than a match for their skills. George Stevenson, who was known as the father of railways, knew the laws of elementary surveying. He could look at the scenery and decide where his tracks would be laid. But George made no claim to be an intellectual. So he sent his son Robert to university. And when Robert came back, they worked together. However, old George, when he saw young Robert working with his theodolite, would quite often say, what are you doing with that piece of machinery, lad? Look at the ground. That will tell you where the rails have got to go. Whether Robert heeded his father's advice or looked at his theodolite, on the Stanhope and Tyne, he got it drastically wrong. What they hadn't realized was that the different inclines that they were putting on these routes ranged from as steep as one in three in places. Terrain that motor cars of today would have great difficulty with. But they were working to the old philosophy that a horse would be there to pull the wagon on to its next stage. And of course, they really hadn't progressed beyond the wagonway mentality. The hills proved too much for the locomotives. They had to resort to stationary engines and even horses to haul the wagons up the steepest inclines. They couldn't get their goods to the consumer in time, and they were so ineffectual that great bottlenecks were springing up. By 1834, when the company had opened, it was already in financial trouble. By 1840, the whole thing had gone into bankruptcy. For a locomotive to pull 60 wagons uphill, there had to be an easy gradient. To take a railway across the Pennines, the only solution was to go through the hills in its path. My great-great-great-grandfather came to this location um, before it was uh, ever a tunnel, 
um, because he came here as a contractor uh, back in the 1830s to work for the Sheffield, Ashton and Manchester uh, Railway. It was a, a very difficult sort of terrain. It was hard rock. The conditions were poor. There was nothing to support any form of industry. And this is what this actually was. It was an industry that was developing here in the heart of the Pennines. The railway companies borrowed from the methods of the canal builders or navigators. By 1846, there were over 200,000 railway navvies at work. Wherever cuttings or tunnels or embankments were required, the navvies moved in. It's difficult for us to visualise the shanty towns, the navvy settlements of 2,000 men, women and children housed in quite squalid conditions at times with frequent outbreaks of smallpox and cholera. I come from a family of Dales farmers and like most Dales farmers, we've been there a long time, four, four centuries or, or, or more in my case, and every every year we would get haymakers coming over and they would be very similar to the navvies who worked on lines like the Settle Carlisle. Hard drinking, hard working, big men often fighting and on the farm like on the railway they did take a lot of keeping in order. Some were skilled bricklayers and masons. The majority were agricultural labourers. Fugitives from chronic unemployment in rural Scotland and Ireland. Severed of social ties the navvies were notorious and feared wherever their work took them. And the work itself was punishing. The daily routine of a navvy can best be summed up as one of unremitting toil, you might almost say unremitting hell in a lot of cases. They were equipped only with pickaxes, wheelbarrows and shovels, and that was about it. It's been said that only the earthworm must move more soil than the railway navvy. And then they came down here into this darkness, sort of troglodytean experience, working up to 16 hours a day in the most terrible conditions. Perhaps 15 or 16 men in a small, confined space. Whatever they had to do, they would have to go off into a corner to do because there was no going out of the, the works to find a convenience. There was sweats, the acrid air, hot, humid, dank, filthy conditions. From morning till night, 16 hours a day, Occasionally they would be going through very, very hard rock and suddenly they'd hit a patch of soft earth, almost like quicksand, and the whole lot would come in on them. Workers willing to face such hazards could demand up to £20 a week, a fantastic sum in the 1840s. But casualties were high. Several decades would pass before safety on the railways was properly addressed. Hundreds and hundreds of men actually died in the constructions of these subterranean passages, all to make this smooth road through the mountains to avoid the climbing over the hills and the heavy gradients that the trains of that day could not cope with. Not since Roman times had there been such projects on this scale, and the great tunnels were matched by a more visible triumph, the viaduct. To build these huge structures, the railway engineers look specifically to Roman architecture, to the aqueducts with their rounded arches. On the Settle to Carlisle Railway, Dent Head is one of 22 viaducts. A hundred feet high, it is built from stone blocks each weighing up to eight tons. To the engineers, the viaducts were a spectacular sign of progress. To others, they were an abomination. Two miles further along, the Ribbled Head Viaduct is over 440 yards long with 24 arches. The challenge for the viaduct designers was to span all natural obstacles in the railway's path. 
Architecturally, the work was traditional, but elsewhere, railway engineers had begun to innovate in more radical ways. And the most precocious of all, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, still in his 20s, was pushing back the boundaries of what was believed possible. Everyone said it would never hold up, that the span was too large to be made of brick, but it'll hold up for ages. You'll see. I think the great thing about Maidenhead Bridge is that it proves how amazingly far-sighted he was. From an engineering point of view, it was a miracle anyway, because it is the longest, flattest brick arch in the world. And it was forecast by all the so-called experts of the day that it was going to fall down. And in actual fact, the contractor, when he took the scaffolding away from the centre of one of the arches, it did shift slightly and something came away. And uh, all these chaps laughed and said, ha ha, that bloody little Frenchman, he's got his comeuppance. You see, he's not as clever as that after all. Brunel wasn't in the least bit phased uh, because he knew that it was sound, uh, structurally sound, and of course it has remained so. But the other thing about this bridge is, he was building things for the future, not necessarily for the day. He built it, obviously, for the trains that he had, but he also built it to accommodate these monsters which roar over it every day. Heaven knows what speed and with colossal weight. And he's reputed to have said that it would take trains at 100 miles an hour. Of course, it was poo-pooed, but there we are. <laughs> the early Victorian pioneers were extraordinary people. They they covered uncharted ground, so they, they were moving into territory which had never been uh, explored before. And my grandmother, who was his granddaughter, said of him uh, that he built things for people uh, and built them as things that he expected they would want later. In other words, he was a visionary. He worked like a lunatic. If he was engaged on a job, he would never stop. 24 hours a day was not unnatural for him. And there was a great story told of him that, that uh, on his journeys back from the country where he was surveying the line, he would get back into his carriage late at night, he would pull out his cigar, because he, he smoked like a chimney stack, and uh, he would go to sleep. And on his return to London, when they hauled him out of his carriage, the ash of his cigar would be laid down his waistcoat, absolutely un untouched, absolutely down there. The railway had driven the Industrial Revolution forward. Each fueled the other. Railways consumed raw material. And new methods and skills of railway building were soon applied in other industries. And on Tyneside, where the first engines had run, the world's first major industrial center was being forged. Mechanics generate mechanics. Engineers generate engineers. People go on, they invent, they improve, they invent, they improve. Uh, things get better. They move out of making uh, steam engines, locomotives. They move into another industry. You can see it down the time, spreading. They go into making machines, steam engines, to put inside ships. They build ships. The whole thing spreads. Looking down towards the mouth of the time, there wasn't a spare inch of space in the water on the river or on the bank side. It was a continuation and sometimes a duplication of little yards, little ironworks with little anvils and smoke and a, a big place where they made ropes of all types and that had been there since the time of the sailing ships. It was always an exciting adventure to go to Newcastle from Tyndall. The highlight was the point where you crossed the bridge, the high level. If you were on the train and you saw the swing bridge and the big vessel coming underneath, you knew that there was a whole conglomeration of something happening. But uppermost of all was a little bit of fear that the train might stop or the bridge might collapse and you would end up in the river below. You gripped your seat and you sometimes closed your eyes, particularly if you were in the middle of the bridge, because looking down, well, it looked like from here to eternity. 
Cole had taken the railway lines into the very center of Newcastle, over the River Tyne. Now the railways themselves boosted demand for power. The market takes off greater because now you're hauling massive amounts of, of coal, much more, 20 times as much coal as you did before. And the whole thing is being driven by uh, a machine which is being fueled by the very stuff you're getting out the ground. Coal, rail and the great industrial rush that followed began to transform the landscape and even the sky. There were steads where you saw the coal dropping down a special mechanism and into the holes on the ship. Now, when that happened, it didn't want to be in the vicinity, but that was where all the smoke and grime came from. And uh, there was a whole pall of black dust and smoke over the river Tyne. And the ironworks were very, very busy. Each night, they opened the furnaces or the covers, but all at once, you would see this magnificent pink glow. It started quite pale, and as it continued, the glow deepened and the color deepened. Everything was bathed in pink, the diffused light like rose, so the things that had been drab and stark and ugly suddenly took on a beauty and to children, it was a form of magic. White ceilings suddenly became pink and grew pinker and pinker till all the room was bathed in this beautiful, it wasn't a harsh pink, but locally it was referred to as the Jarrow Moon. So, um, there must be very few people alive who can remember or have ever seen the Jarrow Moon. The railway was developing its own industrial structure as across the country companies competed to improve services. Bigger engines, better engines, faster engines, better carriages, carriages with lavatories <laughs> that weren't known, and, and better stations and, and better facilities in the stations. The demand went on. Now, that all meant work, didn't it? Over in Dundee, the foundries that made the parts for engines, the carriages that were built in Swindon and Doncaster, everybody was at work. Behind the driver and the fireman were the blacksmiths, the coppersmiths, the greasers, the oilers, a whole army of men required to keep that engine rolling along and to keep the system operating. The bringing together of thousands of workers and all kinds of materials and designs. Nothing like this had ever been seen in the history of the world. Braking systems, air systems, steam systems, these were all completely new and they, they originated, were developed and came to flower in the British Isles, from whence they went to every part of the globe. The railways employed more men than the armed forces, and they looked to the army's hierarchy as a model for their workforce, conferring status according to the degree of skill. You had the gaffer, the boss. <laughs> then under the boss came all the supervisors. Then you had drivers. Then you had firemen. Then you had cleaners. Then you had people that cleaned out the fire dropper. Then you had the fellow that kindled the engines. Then you had the tuber that tubed the engines. Then you had the fitters that serviced the engines. They were all there, all one family. And if you were working in a Tay Bridge locomotive, you were a Tay Bridge man very loyal to the Taybridge fraternity, the wee family. But in Haymarket in, in Edinburgh, then there were Haymarket men. In Aberdeen, there were Ferry Hill Aberdeen men. And everyone knew who you were. You were a Taybridge man, you were a Ferry Hill man, you were a Haymarket man. But always there you were, standing with your chest out and your little nipples standing out as well. I am a man from the Taybridge. The railway bosses promoted their corporate image through a new form of public architecture. The train shed, uh, which was the innovative part of the station, was a mixture of iron and glass. And they were using in the train shed uh, many of the materials that they were actually using to build the railways. And so you actually had an embodiment of the technology in the building. At the railway station, the public encountered technology head on. In particular, the engine. 
the Victorian age is the great age of steam, and you actually saw steam powering the engines. And this led to the creation, the promotion of an idea of the romance of technology. It was actually something to see. There were sightseeing parties who were taken there and shown around. The station was the public face of the railway companies. Its architecture was designed to send the right signals to the passengers and investors who would ultimately foot the bill. There were several railway booms and busts in the mid-Victorian period. Fortunes were lost. Therefore, a revival-style frontage, a solid public building, could reassure investors that here was a solid undertaking they, they put their money into and it wouldn't be lost. It worked. The station's grandeur was solid evidence of the emerging middle class's willingness to play the new stock markets buying railway shares. And in the early years, there were many more booms and busts as lines spread across the country, linking city to city at an astonishing rate. The only big contrast between the early railway era and today is the incredible speed with which things happened. Because between 1830, when the Liverpool to Manchester Railway was opened, and 1852, when the line from London to York and Newcastle was opened, the basic framework of England's railways was designed, bills went through Parliament, and they were built in 22 years. It's the most astonishing feat in terms of organisation as much as anything else, and it shows how far society then was on the side of the railways to allow it to happen. It seemed as if nothing could stand in the way of the railways. In Newcastle, even the castle walls were breached. The optimism, even arrogance of the engineers and their backers, was a new power to be reckoned with. The railways were a completely unstoppable force. They went over, they went under, they went round. They actually had an idea to buy up the entire west end of London and create one gigantic railway station where lines from all over the country would come in in a huge union station. Such was the power of the railway companies at that time, they could actually do anything that they wanted. Gentlemen, it is a fact beyond disputing that the success of this railway must of necessity lead to the prosperity of this city as well as to that of the entire nation. Sitting in Parliament were over 100 MPs. They were called the railway interest and nothing could stop those men. In fact, one of the railway's inspectors said, who is running this country, the railways or Parliament? And the people who represented the railways in Parliament said, well, we are. You just sit and talk, we have to go out and do the job, sir. Every time a railway was opened almost, you'd get a triumphal arch being erected and the local band would turn out and greet the train. And it wasn't until the 1870s, because of an economic recession of those times and the 1880s in particular, you suddenly got the world beginning to question the, the, the way in which the railway almost had a divine right to take all before it. And then there seemed to be an awakening of the national consciousness that enough was enough. The Lake District would be the battleground. Here, the railway opponents were inspired by John Ruskin, who had witnessed the building of a railway through the Peak District in 1840. You enterprised a railway through the valley. You blasted its rocks away, heaped thousands of tons of shale into its lovely stream. The valley is gone, and the gods with it. And now, every fool in Buxton can be in Bakewell in half an hour, and every fool in Bakewell in Buxton but you think a lucrative process of exchange, you fools, everywhere. The Lake District had been made famous by William Wordsworth, another railway critic. Threats of a line here inspired active protest. Ultimately, the opposition was led by Canon Rawnsley, who we now think of as the founder of the National Trust. At that time, he was the leading light in the Lake District Defence Society, which spearheaded the opposition to these railways, and out of that opposition, you can say, in some measure, grew the National Trust. <laughs> 
Well, Canon Romsley was, at one and the same time, very sensitive to nature, to the environment, to the scenery, particularly of the Lake District, but also a very dynamic and energetic personality. He was born the year after Wordsworth died, and because of his admiration for the poet, he rather followed in his footsteps, I think, in this romantic love of the very fragile beauty of this part of the world. The Lake District is a very small corner of England, and yet in that small corner it has England's highest mountains, deepest lakes, arguably the most beautiful scenery. And by the late Victorian age, the Victorians had finally come to appreciate it for what it was. They'd ceased to regard it as a rather frightening, savage area and, and had woken up to the superb scenery up there. And there was this movement in the 1880s to ensure that no more of that scenery should be desecrated by the all-encroaching iron monster. Rawnsley was interested in preserving the peace and tranquillity and the greatest service which Rawnsley and the other railway objectors did for the Lake District is to preserve this beautiful Vale of Newlands where we are now from the threatened railway which would have ruined the, the whole of the shoreline of uh, Derwentwater. The Ennerdale Railway Bill uh, was thrown out amid a great blaze of publicity and Rawnsley overnight became the defender of the lakes and knight in shining armour. The clash between rail and countryside had inspired the first conservationists and spawned the National Trust. Now the impact of new lines on the urban landscape also began to create controversy. This line went right past London's Southwark Cathedral. This environmental disaster area with one of the busiest railway lines in the world passing within about a hundred yards, I suppose, of a medieval cathedral was a sort of symbol of the final crash of the railways into the centre of London. Final because it caused the most appalling uh, financial crash, the Overend Gurney scandal, simply because of the cost of building a railway line into the city of London, into Cannon Street and Blackfriars, which caused a colossal overstrain on the railway companies involved and then on the banks that were backing them. The collapse of bankers over and Gurney was one of the worst financial crashes of the 1800s. Thousands of investors lost their savings. City brokers had prospered by raising finance for railways. But with the main routes built, railway promoters had begun to conjure up more speculative lines with greater risks for the city and investors. They overreached themselves with the London, Chatham and Dover's line into the city, past Southwark Cathedral. So it's a symbol not only of the sort of furthest advance of the railways in terms of messing the environment about within London anywhere and within anywhere else really any other major city but it's also the final disastrous or pyrrhic victory of the railways in that they ruined themselves in this so-called technological triumph which you're going to hear in the background public scepticism about the railways was deepened by more dramatic events that would cast still darker clouds over railway enterprise. Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay. Alas, I'm very sorry to say that 90 lives have been taken away on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. It was about seven o'clock at night. And it was a very windy, blustery night. The wind was blowing so violently strong uh, that the poor signalman had to crawl back into his signal box on all fours. Then the train moved slowly onto the Bridge of Tay until it was about 
midway. And he watched the, the train climbing slowly up towards the high girders. And as he watched, a sudden gust hit the side of the signal box and the structure swayed. And down went the train and the passengers into the Tay. The storm fiended loudly bray because 90 lives had been taken away on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered. The centre spans of the high girders had precipitated into the, the Firth, uh, carrying the train and everybody on board with her. Because none of the passengers were saved to tell the tale of how the disaster happened on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. McGonagall was the worst rhymer of all the British poets, or all the Scottish poets. But McGonagall lived just about 100 or 150 yards from the end of the other side of the Tay Bridge, up in near the bottom of Step Row. And he was sound asleep when the disaster happened. He never knew there was a disaster until the next morning. But that didn't uh, stop old William Topaz McGonagall. Although the Taybridge designer, Sir Thomas Booch, had borne the brunt of responsibility, his plans had been approved by the Government Railway Inspectorate. There were a lot of contributory factors that the designer alone should not be blamed for. Things like bad casting, bad workmanship that was unknown to the designer. And, of course, all these things were, were hidden over. The holes in the castings were filled by putty, and a coat of paint was put on. And it really was... Um, the, the incredible optimism of that period. They thought that they'd almost got to a stage of infallibility. Nothing that they, they could do would go wrong. And unfortunately, that night, the wind and the elements proved that it could. Alongside the stumps of the old Tay Bridge was built a new one. Although much stronger, it did not look vastly different from Booch's original bridge. So the builders added functionless cladding around its spindly legs to give the impression of greater strength. Railways engineering in the beginning was triumphalist. It conquered everything. But after the Taybridge disaster, which was a traumatic disaster for everybody, for the whole nation, the engineers, when they were designing the fourth bridge, had to adopt a belt and braces approach to make it ultra safe and look ultra safe and be ultra safe. But somehow they managed at the same time to transform it into a sort of symphony, a concerto of elegant iron and steel. And the combination was pretty miraculous. Innovations always come in after serious accidents, very often with a loss of life. It happens everywhere in mining, in railways, in engineering, always the same. And I always think that the best of the innovation, the roses of the innovation, the roses with the greatest scent, always have thorns attached to them. And if you make a mistake in picking up the rose, you prick your finger and you draw blood as well as getting the scent of the rose. The tendency is, well, it's done well for 50 years, 60 years, we'll keep it. But then something happens and there's a loss of life and they say, sorry, we must do something about it. So disasters are usually the mother of innovation and progress. After the Tay Bridge, no railway company could afford to ignore safety in construction. Down on the line, there was still plenty of danger. The daily work of the railwaymen was physically demanding with long hours in extreme condition. When I was a fireman, the cab was open, and the driver and the fireman, if he was sitting down, was tucked into the, into the little uh, front of the cab. But the wind came in both sides, and sometimes if you were sitting there, your back was freezing cold, but because the fire was just there, your front was absolutely roasting. 
So you had two parts of your body, but then the coal dried out, and then the wind would whip the coal dust all around, and the fireman had what they called a sprinkler. And if he wasn't too busy shuffling coal, he would sprinkle all around to keep the coal dust down. But there was that, and if it were raining, or even worse, snowing, then the rain would whip into the cab, and you had all lumps of coal dust, all wet, all flying around. In 1891, a parliamentary committee on railway staff hours heard that drivers on the Great Western often worked 80 hours a week, with shifts up to 36 hours at a stretch. In the last decade of Victorian England, the railways were little less than a slaughterhouse. In a period of 25 years, 13,000 men lost their lives working on the railways. We don't, we will never know the number of people who were injured in the same time. But that number of deaths is equal to two major bat sets of battlefields casualties. If you put a man on one of the famous Zombard Kingdom of Earth engines, a locomotive without the cab, and send him out to do a shift of 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 hours without food or without rest, it could only be expected that accidents would happen. And they did. In 1874, the Times said of railwaymen, They are, in fact, the director's scapegoats. And when it is impossible to deny that some great catastrophe has occurred, it is on their shoulders that the entire blame is laid. The problem was that when a man was injured on the railway, he had no recompense. Someone had to have the blame. If the driver did not get the blame, it had to be his assistant. If his assistant could not be afforded the blame, it had to be an act of God. But who was never responsible was the employer. It was easy to see under these conditions how the early trade unions in the industry made safety on the line one of the most important planks in their programs. In 1911, the first national railway strike brought British industry to a standstill. Within 48 hours, the employers caved in and recognized the rail unions. A second bitter strike in 1919 lasted much longer. This led Britain almost to the brink of civil war, a brutality which had never before been seen on the streets of this country, when working men put their heads at risk to the buttons of the police to say, we want safety on the railways, we want a proper deal for the first time in our lives, and we are prepared to face the bayonets and the truncheons of the army and the police. In fact, many in the armed forces sympathized with the railmen, and the government knew the rail unions could enlist other trades in their struggle for a shorter working week. In the end, the strikers won. In 1920, the number of rail workers killed or injured was halved after the introduction of the eight-hour day. This had never been done anywhere in the world before, and this was obtained for workers throughout the world by the railmen of Britain who put their lives at stake in two gigantic strikes at the beginning of the 20th century. We owe them everything. <laughs> What's so astonishing when one looks at the railways and their impact is that one could be talking about the 1990s, not about the 1840s, because the agenda they set, the framework they set in place, is the one we've been operating within ever since. That framework has set the terms of the debate about one of the great construction projects of modern times, the Channel Tunnel. It is a conflict between industry, the environment, and the demand for capital. Not since the creation of the original rail network has Britain sought private investment to finance a major new railway project. We have to draw on 150 years of experience in the creation of railways. And of course, we have rather lost the ability to do that because essentially we haven't built a new mainline railway in Britain since the creation of the Great Central back at the turn of this century rather than the one that we're going to build at the turn of the next century. But today's engineers do enjoy a rich technological inheritance. The engineering solutions of Stevenson, Brunel and others set traditions which today's surveyors and designers still follow. What we do is in fact go right the way back to the very start of railways. 
the selection of the gauge at four foot eight and a half, as, of course, came from a colliery in Northumberland, and it is still the same gauge, and it is the same in Britain as it is in France, as it is in Belgium and Germany. The track all the way to Paris will be left-hand running because the Stevensons were involved in the creation of railways in northern France. And the basic method of digging the 31-mile tunnel owes much to Marc Brunel, Isambard's father. The method the channel tunnelers have used, digging behind a shield, is based on the principles he devised building the first tunnel under the Thames. And while the tunnelers tunnel in the way prescribed by Brunel, up on the surface, the consultants consult just as their predecessors did. It is almost exactly the same to talk to a consultation meeting today as it was back in the 1840s when people were calling together public meetings, in fact, to protest against the, some of the proposals that were being made by the railway companies of the time. In fact, here there is a, a notice um, against the proposed Great Western Railway building through central London and the noisiness, the proximity and the disruption that is going to be caused by the railway. People had to come to, it to uh, come to terms with it then, we will have to come to terms with it now. And the meetings are exactly the same. Spectacular new structures of glass and steel are rising up as railways once again see stations as a chance to display their ambitions. We have the Waterloo International Terminal, there will be a station at Ashford to receive international passengers. We will be creating similar pieces of infrastructure, possibly at St Pancras, possibly below the ground at King's Cross. They are extremely important pieces of infrastructure and they need to make a statement about what the railway is all about. One hundred and twenty years ago, the Dent Head Viaduct was itself a statement. Today, it has become a monument to Victorian engineering vision. Built by the pioneers, scorned by the conservationists, these structures are now themselves protected, as much a part of English landscape as hedgerows and church spires. But the battles go on over the closure of old lines, the construction of new ones, and about who will own the network. The story of Britain's railways has been full of struggle. To build them, and then to learn to live with them. To create the monster, and then to tame it. Across three continents, state records tell stories of power worked out through railways. Kings and governments, imperialists and revolutionaries, all saw the train as a weapon they could control. We begin in Russia. The creation of the 6,000-mile-long Trans-Siberian Railway from St. Petersburg to Vladivostok is a tale of power. The plot is like a Tolstoy novel with emperors and peasants pitted against each other in an exotic location. The train is neither the hero nor the villain of the piece, but its role is never far from center stage. As with all things in pre-revolutionary Russia, the story begins with the Tsars. Alexander III and his son Nicholas II were presiding over a dynasty in decline. 
In the late 19th century, the ability of the Tsar to control his enormous empire was under severe strain. Understandably, with such difficult lines of communication, governing the empire was limited to rather symbolic acts. Say it took a year, a year and a half, or even two years for a message from Moscow to reach the Tobolsk or Irkutsk governor. He needed the same amount of time to report of the fulfillment or non-fulfillment of any orders or to ask for clarification. All this gave the impression of a vast distance that was as real for somebody living in central Russia as the dark side of the moon. Alexander was obsessed with holding on to Russian territories, the ethnic territories in particular, and he was terrified, especially after the assassination of his father, Alexander II, of any kind of revolutionary movement whatsoever. Nicholas was the first royal prince to travel to the Far East in Asia. On his way home, his father asked him to officiate at the groundbreaking ceremony in Vladivostok for the new Trans-Siberian Railway. Vladivostok was a place of exile, but it was also a place of sanctuary. The railway would bring this frontier town much closer to the Tsar. He was obsessed with the perceived tendency of Russian settlers there to take on native ways, that Russians were starting to eat like Eskimos, for instance, and that Alexander was a portent of worse to come. A lot of the natives were singing Yankee Doodle Dandy, which American whalers and American traders had taught to them. And the uh, Siberian regionalist movement uh, uh, asserted the uniqueness of Siberia. It asserted that Siberians were biologically different than Russians, that they had a unique intestinal structure, for instance, and that perhaps uh, in a thousand years, maybe Siberia would be just like America. The state records in St. Petersburg show an increasing royal concern about the deteriorating political situation. Alexander was particularly unhappy about a series of reforms passed by his father, which had included the abolition of serfdom, and which he now regarded as a threat. As freed peasants began to want land of their own, the Tsar saw a potentially volatile situation emerging. With the railway, Alexander thought he had the solution to his problems across the whole empire. Peasants would be directed from European Russia, given new lands in Siberia. They would help to Russify that territory, develop the economy, tie it to the center, and at the same time, relieve some of the demographic problems of European Russia. It seemed to the Tsar that all he needed to stay in power was a railway the longest railway in the world. Alexander commissioned an artist to paint the entire route of the railway. The artist came back after three years with probably the longest watercolor in the world. Railroads were, above all, a symbol of prestige and progress and power. If you had a railroad, then you were a modern, advanced, powerful nation. And the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which was to be the longest railroad ever built, and which was to be built faster than other railroads, would put Russia in the ranks of the leading nations of the world. Naturally, only the Tsar's government, only the state exchequer could solve the problems posed by such an enormous construction project. The Russian bourgeoisie, the new capitalist class, was still too weak. So the Tsar was the key figure to define the future of Russia in the second half of the 19th century, the future of Siberia and the Far East.
The Trans-Siberian was the single most expensive, peaceful undertaking in the history of the modern world up to that time. I would say that the best parallel would have to be the space program of Russia or of the United States, something which has eaten up enormous amounts of uh, government spending and has produced in the end nobody knows exactly what. Actual traffic was opened on the Trans-Siberian stage by stage. Gradually, the railway was put into operation, and unfortunately, it was only opened in its entirety by the outbreak of World War I. Metaphorically speaking, the sluice gates were opened, and a flood of settlers poured out of overpopulated central Russia into the limitless expanses of Siberia. One can say that the railway slowly started to create usable land for Russia from this enormous mythical space called Siberia. It's estimated that four million peasants moved into Siberia along the route of the Trans-Siberian, the largest migration the world had ever seen. The might of imperial power spread further eastward as villages sprang up right across Siberia. The state realized that it's quite difficult to uproot people, whole villages from their usual dwelling place. To do so, people needed to be convinced that resettlement was both necessary and worth a while. So everything possible was done. The government issued all sorts of publicity material, special newspapers, where they described the land, living conditions, and a whole range of state benefits. Travel costs were paid by the state as well. The Tsar let everybody know that those who wanted would be given land in Siberia. A piece of land would be given to everybody to work on. I don't know how many of them came here first. I just know that we came with our mother alone. Nobody came after us in 1912. At first, when we boarded the train, there were some very strange people. I was the oldest. The youngest was only two years old. And we looked at these people and started crying. They had beards. They paid a third of the price of the rail fare to come here. A third. The state gave a third of the amount to the parents so that they could come. And when they came, what? Nothing. Hills and a bit of land. And then they worked and worked. Dozens of migrants were crammed into wagons along with their cattle and their belongings. Even this detail shows us that the government was not really concerned with the actual process of resettling the people. The government was dealing in other matters. The growth of the revolutionary movement, overpopulation, social unrest in Russia in the early 20th century. All this made the government encourage resettlement. But in practical terms, the government did not do anything for the settlers. Siberia was being Russified. However, many peasants arrived to find the best land already taken. Local administrators had parceled off land along the track for themselves. Unless they traveled far from the lifeline of the new railway, there was nowhere for the peasants to go. Along with the 250,000 peasants arriving annually, there was an enormous backwash of people, of dissatisfied peasants, 
who, because they had not received any of the land that was promised to them, went back home. In practical terms, say, of the million peasants that arrived between 1907 and 1911, just one quarter of them actually settled here. The rest had to either leave for the towns or go back altogether. Such was the fate of the settlers. The government intended to build the railroad at any cost. Whatever the cost, it had to have this railroad. And the result was a railroad that was built very rapidly, but, uh, but construction was shoddy throughout. Much of it had to be rebuilt as soon as the railroad opened for operation in 1904. Vita, the builder of the railroad, in the end, confided to other government ministers that he wished they had never built the railroad. He said that it would have been better just to travel along the old Siberian post road. Railways are complicated technical operations which require a significant number of people as well as highly qualified specialists to run them. Engine drivers, metal workers, other skilled workers. So the railway itself became the catalyst for a new group of people that was previously unknown in Siberia, who were united professionally, who formed their own social category, the working class. The railway had taken on a power of its own. The new technology could be used, but not owned. The Tsar was about to discover that his railway was no longer at royal command. The railroad was intended to bind Siberia to the center, to uproot any potential revolutionary activity, especially separatist activity. It was intended to give Russia the advantage in any possible conflict with foreign powers, especially China or England. In fact, what happened was just the opposite of what was intended. It stimulated a revolutionary movement by developing a proletariat for the first time in Siberia, railroad workers who joined hands with revolutionary exiles, and the railroad became a fire cord for the revolutionary movement. It provided a conduit for revolutionary energy in Siberia. It stimulated precisely what the government was attempting to eliminate. The removal of the Tsar was the first revolution of the railway age. Rulers saw railways as power and tried to harness them to their own ambition. But although the train could be used for change, it could create change itself. The railways of India were also at the center of the battle for power. Here, the British had built the largest railway network in the world, a monument to empire. But one man recognized the railway's potential for change. Six months after independence in India, the major character in that drama was dead, shot by an assassin's bullet. Mahatma Gandhi, the charismatic figure who rose to prominence teaching the virtues of simplicity and the values of tradition, was denied a full role in the freedom he had fought to achieve. After his death, when his body was cremated according to the Hindu custom, his ashes were taken by a special train of the Indian Railways from Delhi, several hundred miles east, to the city of Allahabad for a religious ceremony at the confluence of the three great rivers. As a 12-year-old boy, along with various other members of the family and various colleagues and associates, co-workers, comrades, fellow fighters of Gandhi, uh, I went on this special train with this vessel containing his ashes uh, decorated with flowers and garlands. And my memory of that journey is 
flowers. And at every station along the way, more flowers, more flowers, more flowers. So there was a great mountain of flowers. And the scent of that flower still stays with me. And the other great memory of that journey are the crowds who were seeing Gandhi on the train for the last time. And they were touching the train, the wood, the metal, the glass for their last contact with Gandhi. Gandhi's struggle to free the people of India was played out across the whole subcontinent. Like other leaders, Gandhi realized the importance of railways. However, he had started out firmly opposed to this foreign technology. Wood travels at a snail's pace. It can therefore have little to do with the railways. Those who want to do good are not selfish. They are not in a hurry. They know that to impregnate people with good requires a long time. But evil has wings. To build a house takes time. Its destruction takes none. So the railways can become a distributing agency for the evil one only. It may be a debatable matter whether railways spread famines, but it is beyond dispute that they propagate evil. The train was indelibly putting its stamp on India. Gandhi lumped railways, hospitals and lawyers together as hostile forms of Western interference in Indian life. He considered railways as a means of exploitation of the poor. The railways take away the food grains from the peasant uh, when the crop is there. And later on, when he needs the food, he has to buy it at very high cost. And as his concern was with the poor people always, he felt that no harm will come if there are no railways. Nearly half a century after Gandhi's death, Indian slum dwellers scavenging for coke in Old Delhi station offer little confirmation of the dreams of either empire or independence. The railway system that the Indian government inherited from the British needed the profits of empire to survive. That system served British needs first and Indian needs a poor second. You know, I think the British suffered from a sense of guilt when it came to the empire. They knew what they were up to and they recognized that they shouldn't have been up to what they were up to. So what they did was to draw a veneer of respectability on their various deeds and visualize themselves as great reformers, uh, great benefactors of the native populace. The honor, the dignity and the glory of Imperial Britain are concerned in it. The complete permeation of these climbs of the sun by a magnificent system of railway communication would present a series of public monuments vastly surpassing in real grandeur the aqueducts of Rome, the pyramids of Egypt, the Great Wall of China, the temples, palaces and mausoleums of the Great Moguls. Monuments not merely of intelligence and power, but of utility and beneficence. Hogwash. This is the kind of rationalization of railways, you know, which, which makes one laugh. The real purpose of the railways was commercial exploitation of the country. The real, power, real purpose behind introducing the railways was to strengthen British imperial's rule. This is yet another uh, romanticization of the white man's burden. The British built a world in their own likeness. And in the age of empire, the railway was an ideal instrument. Within 30 years of the arrival of the world's first passenger service in Britain, colonial engineers had begun building railways in India. The original impetus was commercial, but the political value had not been overlooked. The railways gave reach to British Empire. They ensured the administration had its outpost in the farthest corners of the country. Here was a country 
which had mastered the technology of taming these humongous iron monsters. It was therefore a country with massive power, and rebelling against it would be futile. From its inception, the notion of railways in India appealed to those charged with the task of governing the subcontinent. The enormous cost could, they claimed, easily be justified by the advantages of increased control. A single glance upon the map will suffice to show how immeasurable are the political advantages to be derived from a system of internal communication, which would admit of full intelligence of every event being transmitted to the government under all circumstances at a speed exceeding fivefold its present rate, and enable the government to bring the main help of its military strength to bear upon any given point in as many days as it until now requires months and to an extent which at present is physically impossible. One often thinks of the British as um, exercising great power in India. But if you think about the initial phases of the Raj, here were the British very far away from home, thousands of miles away, scattered all over the country. There was a great fear that if they didn't keep in regular contact with each other, they would become what was known as OTC, which means off the country. That is, they would take on the mores and the manners of the people right here. And remember, this is a very seductive civilization. So there was a terrible anxiety that they had to keep in touch not only with people back home, but with each other in order to keep their Britishness alive. By developing the resources of a mighty empire, hitherto almost without roads, by stimulating the industry of its inhabitants, whose natural intelligence has been either lost in apathy or chilled by the petrifying influence of caste, while by the easy and rapid concentration of our troops, our power must be irresistible, and the glory would be ours of having done our duty to the hundred millions of our brethren committed to our charge attaining at once a more assured and consolidated empire, a vastly augmented revenue with a more industrious and therefore a richer and a happier people. Now you have to remember that a lot of people had to be perhaps persuaded of the legitimacy of the British Raj and they were persuaded that the British were right to rule over India. And this, I think, that they achieved primarily through the theatricality of power in which the railways were very important. They were not only instruments of communication, they were also expressions of the fact that this power could be displayed all over the country. People didn't have to just come to the capital to see the British power. It could be seen all over the country in terms of the theatricality of the trains. The power of the Raj, expressed through the train and the gun, enabled 60,000 British masters to rule over 600 million subjects across a territory more than 20 times the size of faraway England. In India, the British adopted the techniques of power and display of India's previous conquerors, the Mughals. But India's own rulers, the Maharajas, were also concerned with ostentatious displays of power. Before the British arrived with their railway, the Maharajas' theatricality was expressed through giant hilltop fortresses. My family, which was the ruling family, uh, came here 700 years ago as a small band of 200 horsemen, and the uh, influence spread throughout this territory, which is known as Marwar. And it was really a clan, clan rule as such. But at the same time, we had excellent relations with all the other communities. And uh, that helped us to keep influence and administer this area. The British dealt with the Maharajas by co-opting them to run the empire. They allowed them the trapping but took the actual power away. Like the British, the princes soon saw the potential of railways to impress their subjects. I am His Highness's dog at Kew. Pray tell me, sir, whose dog are you? You know, it's just uh, the, the aping of the British 
this, the false sense of power. The Maharajas knew they had no power. So they're craving after status. And the railways gave them status. There was a special train that consisted of eight bogies. And each of the eight bogies had a different function. There was the prime minister's carriage, and then there was the dining car, and then there were other various carriages for various different functionaries. So in a sense, it was um, a kind of a projection of what you have here, you know, the palace structure. So you had to, and plus the prestige of the Maharaja uh, was important when he was traveling. When any Maharaja traveled, he always traveled with his retinue, particularly our Maharaja, who was very sporting. They used to like horse riding, racing, pig sticking, polo. Whenever they went to, say, Delhi or anywhere else, and they had to travel with their horses, with their grooms, servants, staff, and everything else. And it had a sense of power because anyone who saw the special with its white saloon and coming along, Automatically, a crowd would come to wherever the uh, train was coming. There were a couple of Maharajas who thought the railways would open up their kingdoms for development. But these were very, very rare. These principalities were too small. They didn't need trains to fortify their power in their principalities. The local police, the, such military as they had, uh, was enough. And there was always the British resident to, which, to whom they could run in case of trouble. And the uh, subjects knew that the might of the Maharaja in, a, in crisis would be backed up by the might of the empire. Faced with the power of the Maharajas and of the British, Gandhi finally turned to the railways. Nothing less than independence for India could begin to address the problems. Whatever power the British held had to be used against them, even if that meant coming to terms with the railway. The British used the railways to consolidate their empire, and Gandhi used the British-built railways to undermine the empire. Gandhi used the railways to reach the Indian people in all the extremities of this vast subcontinent. The people of India used the railways to reach him. The objectives that emerged were possible for a man like Gandhi to reach, I'm sure were never thought of by those who invented the trains. Gandhi was certainly a soaring idealist, but at the same time, he was also a very sober realist, and therefore he tried to work out a synthesis between the lasting values of Indian culture, of our traditions, and of the good values in Western culture. And that is why perhaps he got reconciled to the use of railways in later life. For Gandhi, simply using the train to travel was not enough. The medium of travel had to be part of the message. Gandhiji always traveled third class. He wanted to identify himself with the poor people, with the common people who could only afford third class travel. To Gandhi, symbolism was very important. And he realized that the symbol that would attract Indians most was that of a man who sacrifices. And this step was prompted by the awareness that if he wanted to unite India, he had to symbolize the aspirations of India. He had to symbolize the kind of people Indians would follow from their own tradition. And therefore, traveling by third class fitted well into the entire approach that he has adopted in politics. Gandhi used railways like politicians of today use television, extending his personal appearances to a wider audience. The railways amplified his call to the Indian masses and enabled his personal magnetism to reach people who before could only have heard of him but never have seen him. One of the uh, interesting decisions of his was to locate his ashram in the mid-30s 
for the last 15 years or so of his life in uh, a village called Sevagram, which was only four miles from a railway station called Vardha. And Vardha uh, stands on the intersection of the great trunk routes of the Indian railways. Not only was this place more or less equidistant from all the different corners of India, it also made it possible for political figures to stop at Vardha and make use of their journey for additional political consultations with Gandhi. After nearly a century of British control, the railways of India were being taken over by one man. The trains were serving a new master, and throughout the country, there was the feeling that the struggle for freedom was nearly won. Gandhi symbolized that optimism. When I was with Gandhiji, at that time, he had become a Mahatma, and uh, he was revered all over India particularly by the common people, the poor people. They would stand there for hours, the whole night perhaps, and they wanted just to have a glimpse of him. People were just worshipful, and uh, they were willing to give whatever little they had, because they felt that this man stood for them, and they had full faith in him that he will take India to independence. India, like Russia, felt the power of the train as the drama of oppression and liberation was played out on the railways. At first, it seemed that railways were the perfect tools of imperialism for the Tsar and the Raj. But in both cases, the railways became the allies of the people. India's independence was the starting shot for the race to end the British Empire. However, the battle for power by rail was by no means over. In Africa, the white man came for slaves and wealth. Cecil Rhodes' dream of a Cape to Cairo railway was a white dream of power and glory. Africans, no longer needed as slaves, were merely in the way. Before the arrival of the white man, the Victor Falls area was a sacred place, in that uh, there were three shrines in this area. In the first place, they were not consulted. Uh, they just saw uh, people moving in, uh, just telling them say they were putting a bridge and a rail line uh, over their shrine. Most unfortunately, the bridge itself was erected at a point where the offerings uh, shrine was. So it was in the process destroyed. When the railways were being built in this part of the world, the, the forces of colonial power were establishing themselves mercilessly, mercilessly, and they whipped left, right, and center. They even killed left, right, and center, taking colonial power to the interior of Africa to exploit the natural resources, to exploit the people themselves, to subjugate them. Those were things which were happening. These are history, fortunately, now. Today in Central Africa, there is a railway that is not a monument to empire, nor a legacy of imperial ambition. 1,200 miles of Chinese and African-built track connect Zambia and Tanzania and give landlocked Zambia access to the sea. It was the first black railway in Africa and China's largest ever aid project. 
Now it's known as the Tazara, but when it was built, it was called the Freedom Railway. It wasn't really designed to be a sort of anti-Western railway at all. It was just that we wanted to get away from dependence on South Africa, dependence on Rhodesia, dependence on the Portuguese, um, uh, Mozambique, and Portuguese, Angola. So we started building <laughs> with the assistance of the Chinese, and uh, that's how we built it. This uh, railway was uh, signed by the president of Tanzania, the president of Zambia, and also the chairman of China. So I thought this railway must be a very important railway. So I, at that time, I will uh, contribute all of my strength and my life to this railway. <laughs> The first reaction was that we had sold ourselves to the communist uh, regimes and we were therefore going to be tied hand and foot to them to do whatever they wanted in this country. The second one was a cynicism that the Chinese cannot possibly build a railway which would run. And thirdly, that uh, the whole of the cost would be so expensive, so high, that we'll never be able to repay the money, and so on and so on and so on. As China uh, was a developing country and uh, not very rich, I think it's a duty for us to help our friends. So that's my duty to come here, to give some assistance to the Africans. Zambia, formerly Northern Rhodesia, finally gained independence in 1964 and was immediately one of the wealthiest of the new African nations. Zambia had copper, masses of it, and the world was prepared to pay for it. However, the lack of a seaport left her at the mercy of her neighbors. Zambia was completely landlocked. Up to 1964, the arrangements were that we, as a landlocked country, northern Rhodesia, were tied firmly to the route to the south. We had to find ways of, uh, whilst accepting that situation, work our way out of uh, a very, very difficult uh, constraint. The only way out of the dilemma was to go north, through Tanzania to the sea. One of the poorest of the newly independent countries, Tanzania also wanted a railway of its own. It had a port at Dar es Salaam, but like Zambia, could not build a railway without help. For both countries, the new route was identified with freedom and progress. Practically all Zambia's copper passed over Victoria Falls Bridge, carried by Rhodesian railways. The West both controlled the route and had massive interests in Zambian copper. However, with the self-confidence of independence, the Africans wanted to change that. The West did not. The financing of the study to see whether it was a justifiable project from the investment point of view was done by the British, the Canadians, and the other Western uh, authorities. And yet, when the uh, project came out uh, to show that it was a viable project to stand on feet, or not to produce any problems on the developing nations' uh, investment programs, suddenly they all suffered, um, not called feet as much as claimed they had no money, maybe we'll go around the next one. And we spent a lot of time going around every one of them, not one of them was prepared to do anything. They could not say the project is unviable, uh, but equally they couldn't give us a reason. We knocked at the doors of Westminster and got no favorable response. Later we went on to the Americans, got no favorable response. And of course, what the British did, you'd expect the Americans to support. <laughs> so um, we drew a blank from Western powers. In 1965, southern Rhodesia declared independence from Britain. When the nightmare happened, 
and the Premier Ian Smith closed the border. Zambia lost her route to the sea. Railways are romantic things, but the story of this one is turning a little sour. Normally, Zambia would use Rhodesian railways for all imports and exports. The effect is, at the moment, that all traffic is virtually at a standstill. The Rhodesians have held up an estimated 18 million pounds worth of copper on its way south. The mining companies have stopped shipping, and imports to Zambia are stopping too. Unless something remarkable happens, this is the end. What followed highlighted the absurdity of the situation. With the southern border closed, Zambia had to airlift the copper out to sell it. The old colonial road, the Great North Road, was pressed into service to move the copper. But heavy rains turned the dirt track into a quagmire that earned the name the Hell Run. The case for a new railway had been made. Without Western support, the answer lay in the east. For Tanzania, Zambia's partner in the railway, the motive was not only economic, but ideological. Julius Nereri, the socialist leader of Tanzania, was no acolyte of the West. When China made overtures to him, he listened. The Chinese had been cultivating their relationships very well with the Tanzania. And the Chinese said, if you want to uh, talk to us. We are talking well with Tanzania, so why don't you come and talk with us as well? So the moving force was uh, a convergence of uh, the no from the West, plus the fact that if in fact we did nothing, the West would be saying, yeah, yeah, we told you, the thing is not a starter. You know, just forget it. Go back to Rhodesia Railways. I think that's uh, part of the combination. Unfortunately, during the time of East-West confrontation, time of Cold War, men lost their reason and began to think only in terms of who supports us, who opposes us. In fact, one day, Ch Chairman Mo joked with us, had a delegation. He said, be very careful. If you come here too often, the West will think you're going, you're going red. He said that to me, and we laughed about it. And uh, so they knew, but at no time did they ever ask us to be with what we're not at all. The massive Tanzania to Zambia railway, the Tazara, was started in 1970. China has offered, uh, first of all, to uh, make a survey of the Tanzanian side of the projected um, railway. Fifty thousand Chinese experts, engineers, and workers came to Africa during the construction period. And in return, several thousand Africans went to Beijing to study Chinese railway technology. To the West, it seemed that the Chinese were colonizing Africa. The Cold War had entered Zambia, but the Africans were not taking sides. They were holding on to their independence. It was no more alien for them to deal with the Chinese than with Westerners. They were Africans first and foremost. It was in 1972 when I won a scholarship to go to China. And that is the first time when I saw a Chinese. Just to hear the Chinese discussing among themselves, I couldn't hear anything. It sounded as if it is birds in the tree trying to talk to one another. They had a very powerful impact on our people. First of all, they participated in the construction of that railway. They were being trained by the Chinese instructors to run it. And uh, it strengthened our political stance on issues of liberation. That strengthened our ability to speak our minds on issues that affected 
our fellow men in this region, those who are struggling for independence in Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe today, and South Africa itself, Namibia. The essence of building this railway was shrouded in politics. The West were saying this is not possible. And a third world country like China cannot view the railway. So the Chinese, when they came, they were so much determined that they didn't want to do any other thing apart from concentrating on their work of building the railway line. That time I was very young, only 24 years old. I have no knowledge about the outside world. The African people, uh, they, they are a very honest and polite and a very friendly for us. So we are in very good cooperation during our survey and design. The Zambians felt that the, the Chinese were a very disciplined people because when they saw the Chinese working, they couldn't tell who is a leader, who is a workman. All of them acted the same and they never gave the problems to anybody. The Tazara was completed in 1975 and shown to the world as a triumph of third world cooperation. The British said it was unnecessary. The Americans called it the Bamboo Railway. But for the Africans, it was a victory over their former colonial masters. Once again, the power of the railway had been taken over by the people.